Coach V Show. Welcome to the Coach V Show, your show for personal development with expert insights and interviews to help you, me, and we work to be our best and live our best life. Offering for your consideration life lessons, success frameworks, and behavioral models to help you achieve your dreams, hopes, and aspirations, and anything it is that you want in this thing called life, leadership, and business, where iron sharpens iron. Together we rise here on the Coach V Show, powered by Island City, where the beach meets the streets. Today, I am super juiced to have a serial entrepreneur that has international influence and experience Brother Willie Salavea is here as the Coach V guest feature here on Island City. And Willie attended El Camino College in Torrance, shout out Torrance, California, and began yeah. his career in the hospitality and travel industries, working for major consumer travel bands as Sheraton and United Airlines. And this isn't just the first time you're gonna hear this. You're gonna hear multiple national name brands and worldwide name brands here on the show. After several advancements, he accepted an opportunity to apply his broad travel experience in the tourism industry in New Zealand. Shout out Aotearoa, working for Gulliver's Pacific, where he was the director of tourism for the US and Canada. Following the downturn in tourism post 9-11, Willie returned to the United States and settled in Viva Las Vegas. It was here while working at the Aladdin Resort and Casino that Willie noticed a proliferation of paper and plastic lays being used for weddings and other events. Building off of his Pacific Island heritage and strong sales and marketing skills, Willie uh, started a business importing fresh flowers, lays, which quickly grew and expanded to include producing authentic Pacific Island entertainment and event planning. The lay business started to take a large, take on larger events, including high school and college graduations where Willie enhanced the product offering to include cuckoo nut lays, which you're seeing all over the country today, painted in school colors. Building upon his theme, Willie uh, formed a new company called Style Pacifica and introduced the Go Nut brand of collegiate licensed Kukui Nut Ladies. Over the years of expanding the business and the brand, Willie branched out into professional sports with licensing from the NFL, NHL, NBA, and most recently added Mr. Olympia, designing and managing licensed apparel for Mr. Olympia events worldwide and running the officially licensed OlympiaGear.com online store. Most recently, on account of the COVID pandemic, Style Pacifica, in support of their Polynesian sports and academic customer base, started manufacturing masks for schools along with Polynesian print designs. As of May 1st, 2021, Willie's company has been selected to design, market, and manufacture all health and fitness products for Mexico and Central and South America. Married to his husband, Scott Ribeiro, and his son, Priston, makes up his family comprised and living out in Las Vegas. Hey, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but today we are sharing with the world, brother Willie Salavea. Welcome to the Coach V Show, Willie. Thanks, Coach V, for the introduction. I appreciate that, but that was a lot of information. <laughs> oh, man, you have just such a wealth of experience and knowledge. What courage, Willie. If you haven't heard it from the Polynesian community, I would just like to share my applause. And really, I've, I've become a fan since. Shout out to, who is it, my man, who introduced us together? Your brother. Oh, uh, out of Dallas, out of Texas. Oh my gosh, I just lost his name. Man. So I met him. To he introduced us. We're both drawing a blank on our brother from the University of Arizona and McCann Utu. McCann Utu. Man, <laughs> shout out McCann. McCann, McCann we're sorry, over here brother. so juiced about getting this show going. McCann. We both do a blank real quick there. So shout out to McCann Utu for introducing me to a very valuable 
person within the Polynesian community and the worldwide business community in large. Willie, welcome to the show. Please tell us in the audience your Genesis point. Uh, thanks, Coach V. Well, it, it, it's, it's been a journey definitely uh, for me. Um, starting, I was born in Redondo Beach, California. Um, grew up with a uh, uh, Palangi grandmother who was basically, you know, back in the 50s, 60s when our, our grandparents moved here, they had more than one wife. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> and I think a lot of us know. Well, I was raised by one of his um, friends and uh, I grew up with her. Her name was Olive Justine um, Gregory and she lived in Redondo Beach. And so basically grew up in, in that neighborhood. Um, I knew I was Samoan. I knew who my parents were, but I really didn't connect. I, I really didn't, the only Samoan I knew was because of church. My grandparents mm -hmm. would come pick me up, take me to church on Sundays. And I could remember going to um, the churches in Compton. Uh, it was a Seventh-day Adventist church. I was a member of that church. And I just wanted to go to Park Village so often. You know, it was, I don't know if you guys know about Park Village, but it was one of those places where it was, the kids got to play outside and play hide and seek out at night where if we were in Dondo Beach, we had to be in when the sun went down. <laughs> and for some reason, I just wanted to live in Compton because I got to play, you know. Um, fast forward, uh, I, I graduated from Maricosta High School in Manhattan Beach, California. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but playing football there, I was a pretty good big kid. I was about 325 pounds. So I was a lot of, I was big. You know, right, right, and, um, right. uh, and with that came a lot of, um, I guess, self-esteem issues. Growing up in an all white neighborhood and blonde hair, blue eyes, everybody looked good and slim. I always wanted to be that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I could remember walking around school, I wanted to identify with being someone. So I would wear my um, my lava lava around my neck, right, right. you know, because it was just something that I got to show that I was an islander, and that lava lava would also cover my my man boobs because I was so big, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I could going back to that time, I could always remember that as being a, a part of my I, my my esteem. I didn't have a lot of it, and then um, I was I was still popular in school because there was like 11 Pacific Island kids there. You know, it was the, the Hanneman family, the Fanoi Moanas, the Salaveas, Leonais, um, uh, Willis family. There was, a, you know, quite a few. There was 11 to be exact because we, we all knew each other. We called each other family and cousins. Um, uh, after, after high school, when I left, um, uh, Redondo Beach, and I moved to New Zealand. Mm. And uh, uh, I left home because my grandmother passed away. So, and at that time, I was also offered a lot of uh, high school, I mean, um, college football scholarships to play. And um, she was one of those grandparents that um, would always say to me, whatever you do, don't leave me. Don't leave me. I don't want to die alone. So I ended up giving away all those scholarships and I stayed home with her and she passed away a year later. And so I decided, well, I can't go to college here anymore. And I was at El Camino for a couple of semesters at mm -hmm. that point. And um, I was not a good student. <laughs> I was not a good student at all. I think I majored in partying, you know, right, I, right. I, I'd love to drink. And I think that's where I started that, um, that whole lifestyle of like, oh, I, I, you know, the weekends, let's go hang out with our cousins and we drink in the parking lot. You know, I thought that was a big deal. And then the next week we'd be in a park or we'd be drinking in a garage and so and so, you know, it was always about drinking. Right. So school wasn't important for me. But I would go to class and um, act up, make pretend I was learning something, but it, it didn't work out for me. So I decided I'd move to New Zealand for the first time. This is my first time. And I moved to New Zealand, loved the place. I actually got, um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. But then I missed home because I was only 19 years old. 
Mm -hmm. So I turned around, I moved back to um, Redondo. And as soon as I got here, I applied for a, a job at um, United Airlines. And I got it and I thought, this is the perfect job for me. You know, I love it because I got to talk a lot. I got to meet so many people. And then um, I did really well at the job in reservations that they moved me to be the instructor for all the new hires. And so I became the youngest instructor for United Airlines out of Chicago. Mm. Uh, they would fly me back and forth. So all the new hires, and I know there's a lot of people that work for United Airlines that are still there that I trained. and. Um, uh, it was, I, I did that job for oh, eight years. And during that time, I used my travel benefits. I was broke as hell, but I used my travel benefits. And um, at the, that time, I worked two jobs. So I worked like 6 to 2.30 uh, in the morning, or 6 a.m. to 2.30 in the afternoon at United Airlines. And then I rushed off to the Sheraton Hotel, and I worked there from 3 to 11.30. And uh, lo and behold, that's when Polynesian Airlines used to fly here from uh, Upolu. And that's mm -hmm. where their crew stayed. Well, that was, oh gosh, you know, every time the crew arrived, again, you know, where did Willie go? With the crew. And we just party all night long. So right. my, my drinking had become um, a very important part of my life. And the reason I'm sharing that is because it'll lead up to other parts of my life. Um, yes, sir. So um, while working at um, United Airlines, I, I, I've got to share the story because I'd get on a plane when I didn't have any money, mm -hmm. I was able to travel free and I would jump on flights like from LA to New York, right? And they would put me in first class because that's the benefit you get when you work for an airline. And the only reason I did that, I'd catch the red eye so I could drink all night, get to New York, party there you know do, in the airport do a turnaround and party all the way back wow that was the way i would drink party and um i do the same thing in hawaii you know i'd finish at 11 30 at night at the sheraton the next red eye flight to hawaii left at midnight i jump on that flight on a friday night party all weekend in hawaii and then jump on a flight to get back on sunday to start work on monday morning at six well that became a real uh started to take a lot of energy and money right when you're drinking that much and i remember um at the time i was i knew i was gay at that time but it was in the early 90s and it was hard for i guess it's okay if you're fa -fa finge or mm. you know you act the part of a fafa finge in the Samoan or Pacific Island culture to be accepted. Right. But when you're not feminine or you don't act fafa finge, it's hard to come out and say you're gay. Right. You know, it's like, oh, <laughs> why would you, even, you know, you're not gay. And I could remember hiding it. And I met this person um, when I'd flown to New Zealand and his name was uh, Terry, he was Maori. And we hit it off and we became very close. So I came back uh, to the mainland and I flew back and forth to New Zealand. I probably did over 100,000 miles that year and <laughs> going back and forth. And I know my parents would ask, who are you seeing down there? And they're like, oh, I'm seeing this girl. Her name is Terry. <laughs> right, right, right. right? <laughs> and then it came to the point where um, I had no, I ran out of money, you know, because I was traveling there and all that. So United Airlines had given me these, we had buddy passes. So we had six buddy passes at the time. And I could remember going to New Zealand and I went down there and I put an ad in the newspaper for people in New Zealand who wanted to buy a buddy pass for a thousand dollars. Right, right. And I would sell it to them so that I could get money. Well, one of the news, uh, one of the United Airlines employees found the ad down there, right? And fire and reported me, and when I got back to the U.S., I was fired. Right. It was like the worst. It hurt me so bad because that was the greatest job I ever had. But then now I look at my life. Now I understand why things happen the way they happen. You know, and um, I could have stayed in that self pity or woe was me, but I didn't. 
And so um, I ended up moving to New Zealand and I was with uh, Terry for a while and things were great. And I worked, I got a job for the um, Price Waterhouse Cooper um, as the USA um, representative. So what that meant is for tra for as a destination. So what that meant is I would travel to these wonderful places and I would promote the USA as a destination. <laughs> it right. was such a cushy job. Right. And um, so I did that for a long time um, while living in New Zealand. And then same thing. Um, I was in Fiji on a conference with the company and um, we were staying at the Sheraton dinner aisle, had a way too much to drink. You know, and caused the scene. I'm not going to get into what the scene was, mm -hmm. but again, lost my job. Fired. And, and that's Polynesian. We we've, we've been known to make great scenes, both negative and positive. Right, 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 right Willie. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, mine were <laughs> not very positive at this right? time in my life. Um. So I lost that job. I I stayed in New Zealand, and I started my own company. Um, and what I would do is I would get celebrities to take these cruises. Um, and so I would get famous chefs that were in New Zealand and I would uh, create um, an entire travel, travel package around it and people would book that. And that did very well for a long, for a while. So it was called Exit Tours. So mm -hmm. I managed that and ran that in New Zealand for a long time. And then 9-11 came around and um, when I saw that and I was in New Zealand, I couldn't believe it. And I felt homesick. Mm. I felt like I had to come back home. So I jumped on a plane, came back um, to Redondo Beach and I could not justify paying $1,500 a month for a studio. <laughs> that right. was still five miles away from the beach, you know? Yeah, yeah. And at that time people were saying, go to Vegas, you know, everybody's moving to Vegas. That's where it's happening. So I did, and I thought I could easily get a job here in the casinos because I worked in the travel industry. Well, when I got here, I couldn't get a job. It was, um, the reason I couldn't get a job is you had to have credit. They do a credit background check on you when right. you when you get a job in uh, for the casinos. And I didn't have any credit because I'd lived in New Zealand for eight years. And so, I needed money. And so I took this job. I don't know if you guys have ever been to the malls, but um, those annoying people that pull you in and say, come here, come check this lotion out. And they put lotion on your hand and you mm -hmm. rub it all over and say, can you feel how soft your hands and it helps eczema and it helps this. Yeah, just, yeah. just a load of crap. That was my job and it was a commission job only. And I can remember how humiliating it was for me um, to go, from where I was to doing that. And I could remember there was a Yankee candle store next to that cart. And I would jump into that store anytime I saw somebody come in. <laughs> and um, I continued at that job for months. And I remember people walking into the Aladdin Casino and Hotel with plastic glaze, you know, the one. You know, yeah, yeah. Silk yeah, glaze. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I would look at them and go, how tacky wearing those on your wedding day. Right. So, right. so I thought, hmm, let me go upstairs and just tell the people up at the um, the chapel that I import lays from Hawaii. Let's see what happened. And I was I was thinking nobody's gonna you know call me. And I wrote my name on a piece of paper and um, gave it to them. The next day I got a call. They wanted lays for a wedding. And I had no idea of how to do this. Like, what, <laughs> you I had no idea. Know. You didn't, I didn't know. know. I didn't know what wholesale was. I didn't know what retail was. I didn't know what markups were. I just knew that if I bought some, I'm going to add some money to make some money. That was common sense, right? Mm. So the only place I knew where to get Lay's was when I was in Hawaii, you know, the, the Lay stands at the Hawaii airport. Right, right. In Honolulu. right. So I thought, well, who would I know there? I don't know who to call. And that's when we had the phone books, but I only had the phone book for Las Vegas. Las Vegas, <laughs> right, right. And we, could, I didn't, we didn't have a, the Google kind of thing. Oh, let's Google Lace. So I remember, okay, a common name is Moana, right? 
So I looked up more, I did 4-1, can I get uh, connected to Auntie Moana's lay stand? And I got Auntie Moana's lay stand at Honolulu Airport. And I- But you ordered, had no idea if there was such a Moana's lay stand? No idea. I just thought, let me try. Okay. It's a common name. It was yeah, either yeah. gonna be Moana or Leilani. Right, 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 right. <laughs> real talk, so, real talk. Real talk. Yeah. So I called, I got Auntie Moana's lay stand. I said, I need to order these lays. Uh, for a wedding, can you make suggestions? So she did. And then she told me how much money it was. I was like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get this kind of money? So I borrowed the money from the people that worked at the kiosk for me, brought the lays over, they shipped over. I marked them up twice the amount. So I doubled the price and they bought them. And they thought it was the greatest thing ever that they, were, I, they could get lays in Hawaii, I mean, in Vegas. So long story short, I became the lay guy. You know, right. people would like, oh, call this guy. He, he could bring late. And because of all the wedding chapels in Las Vegas, I was doing really well. <laughs> so lo and behold, I quit the, um, the uh, aloe vera stand. But there was a job out on the strip that people, that were, they were making great tips. Um, I don't know if you know the, remember the pedicabs where people sit in the back and you ride the bike on the Las Vegas strip? Yeah, 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 yeah. They had them. Well, I took that job. I thought, this is great because what I could do is sell lays from the back of my pedicab. <laughs> if you get in, you could ride it and then you pay $10 for a lay because I was only paying $1.90 for them from Hawaii. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was selling the 10. So I learned retail really quick, right? After that, that experience. And um, so I would sell these lays and then any extra lays I would have left over, I would, I would put my bike away and then I go in front of the Bellagio at like one o'clock in the morning. And I would be out there getting my hustle on to get rid of the lays because I needed to make that money back. Right. So I'd right. stay out there. I'd get kicked off from the Bellagio Hotel because you're not allowed to sell in front of the Bellagio. And I'd cross the street and go over to the, um, the uh, Paris Hotel. I'd get kicked off for that. And then I'd go back in front of the Bellagio, just back and forth getting kicked off. And then I found out that they could kick you off the um, hotel property. But not the but sidewalk. Not the sidewalk where the bus stop is. That's so right. I was on the bus stop working the bus stop. And the one night I was there, this guy taps me on the shoulder and he says, are these your lays? I'm like, well, what do you want to know for? <laughs> and he's like, I'm the director of entertainment at MGM, the big hotel. And I said, and he said, these lays would do really well over there. Um, would you be interested in coming and bringing these to the concert? The director runs into you by the bus stop on the sidewalk, Willie. Yeah, he was out there just hanging out that night, one o'clock in the morning. Right, this is right. Weird, right. So then um, he says, well, why don't you bring these lays to an event we're having the following week over at MGM? I was like, well, what event are you? He goes, oh, we're having a concert and it's uh, Jimmy Buffett. I'm like, well, who's Jimmy Buffett? Jimmy Buffett. Wow. And now, if you guys know who Jimmy Buffett is, it's Margaritaville, right? That's right. Uh, wasted away again, Margarita, brown eyed yeah. girl. I had no idea who this guy was. I didn't listen to that kind of music, you know? So um, I said, yeah, uh, you know, how many lays should I bring over? He goes, bring over 5,000. I'm like, 5,000 lays? <laughs> Where am I going to get money to buy 5,000? That's $10,000, right? Right. To buy 5,000 lays. So I borrowed money from all the pedicab drivers. And I told them I would give them 10% back after I sold all the lakes. And they trusted me because they knew my work ethic on the pedicab out there. I'd show up, I'd hustle, try to get rides all the time. And so they gave me the money to buy the flowers. And so we went out to the event and I called my mom and all the aunties and they came out in their mumus, their- uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I said, okay. And the, the lays were already strung. They're already made, right? So we laid the falas. I said, bring the falas, like, you know, the old days, and we'll put it on the ground. And then you guys could sit there and make sure you wear your big hats and, you know, talk, talk Samoan to each other. And then um, they, they came, they brought the falas. There was five of them. And then we bought the um, Plumeria cologne from ABC store. Yeah. <laughs> And we sprayed all the orchid lays because orchids don't have any smell, right? No smell, just yeah, orchid. Yeah. So we sprayed it with all the plumeria um, perfume and they sat down there and they made pretend they were making the lays, you know, with the, the needle. 
but they only cut one lay and the, the rest of the lays were in a box behind the bush. <laughs> right. So every time people would buy, you know, um, buy a lay, they, they had uh, one of my nieces grab a lay and give it to them. And we sold them for $20 a piece and we sold out in an hour and a half. You made 200 racks that night? Oh, we made, we made a lot of money that night. You took 5,000 lays times 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100 racks, but you sold it for how much? $20. $20. 20 bucks. Like, I said, yeah. So we paid back everybody. We did really well. And again, it's one of those blessings where it just, you don't understand why things happen. That following weekend, Margaritaville was opening, Jimmy Buffett's restaurant on the Las Vegas Strip. Right. And they saw us there and they said, wow, we can't believe how well these lays did. So we did a deal with them. We opened up a lay stand inside Margaritaville and we brought a Polynesian show, uh, Hot Lava, a guy by the name of Rooney Takayang out here. So he brought all his dancers. We put coconut bras on them and lava lavas. And they walked around the restaurant selling fresh flower lays. And we made a killing because that rest. That is amazing. We were was paying so about two busy. Bucks. And then we put up on a floor show. We had a floor show going on. Wow. And retail at 20. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. So then the fresh flower lay business took off. We did really well. Um, and then Hawaii sent me some black and orange kukui nuts. And I don't know if you guys, people know what kukui nuts are. They're, the, they're black or they're brown. They're natural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you go to Hawaii, they, you see them all over the place. So Hawaii sent some black and orange ones. I'm like, who the hell is going to buy these ugly things? So we put it at the lay stand at Margaritaville. And a lady came up. She goes, I need to order 500 of those. I'm like, why? She goes, yeah, yeah. The Calif I'm the um, president of the Booster Club for the San Francisco Giants. And their colors are black and orange. Right. And I was like, oh, shit, what a great idea. <laughs> so then I thought, what if we put logos on these things, you know? So I had an artist friend of mine, he had paintbrushes, and he hand painted logos on the Kukui nuts at the time. And we were selling them like crazy. <laughs> yeah i think the first yeah. one i might have seen like that a handful of years ago maybe was usc yeah well usc was on one of our first accounts yeah and i was like this is freaking genius <laughs> yeah it's a, it, you know why i always relate my story to is like the shoelaces you know that plastic piece at the end of the shoelace yes sir you know millions of dollars are made from that from that little idea yeah, and I just yeah. think of my idea, I go, why didn't somebody think about this, you know, kukui nuts, necklace, but it happened. So what we did from that day, when we were at Margaritaville, we thought, what a great idea. Let's get these, um, let's put college logos on these, or let's put logos on them. So I went to a show in Pittsburgh. It was the, um, it was the uh, alumni show. So all the colleges from around the country go to this trade show. And then they look for new items for their alumni. So we went to that. And um, I met a group out there in Pittsburgh, their Pacific Island group. They came and did a show before my, uh, my presentation to the, the group. I always try to incorporate Pacific Island culture. Yeah, yeah. In my stuff. So it was, it was awesome. So we did that. And after everybody comes to the tables to look at your product and touch and feel, our booth was so packed. Like people wanted, they're like, oh my gosh, we want to order this for our alumni. You know, they love this. They could wear it to the football games. Huh? And then the question came, well, who do you license this with? I'm like, <laughs> what's a license? Oh, yeah, 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 right, right, right. <laughs> I, no clue what licensing was. And I said, oh, simple question. So how do you get licensing? Right. And they said, well, um, you need some history with the uh, with us to get licensing. I'm like, well, if I can't license the product, how do I get history, right? And so they they uh, suggested I I team up with a company that already had a license and put this under their license. And so I did. I, I did my research. I met this woman out of Washington D.C. Um, her name was 
I'm not going to give her name because there's more to the story. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was great. You know, she was wonderful. I flew her out to Vegas. She met with us here. And um, so what we did is we would give her the product. We would make the product because we manufactured it. We would sell it to her. She would license it. She would sell it back to us and we would distribute it to the colleges. Well, that did really well for the first year. We, we were killing it in the industry. We were in every bookstore, every football game. It, it was just rolling in. And it did so well that the following year, she wrote, she called me and said, well, um, we want you out of the business. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, we decided we're going to do this on our own. Right. And because They're going to take your idea. They're going to yeah. take your idea. Yeah. They did. Because they, did. they have the licensing and they felt like they That's had That's right. Right. Yeah. She had the license. So we were stuck and I had invested everything I had made. So we basically, we almost went bankrupt. And I was like, I'm not going to let this slide. You know, that's a Pacific Island product. It's a jewelry. Why am I going to let you have this? So I knew USC was a big college that had a lot of Pacific Islander kids, right, attending there. So I went out there. I, I set up a meeting. I met with the licensing company, and I said, "Look, I explained what the jewelry was. There is no, you know, we have all these Pacific Islanders that are playing football." And there's no representation, none, zero in the industry, in the apparel industry, or in the manufacturing of goods for colleges. I said, just give us this one product under jewelry. And he took a chance on us. So he gave us the license for one year. We went to the football. First game we did was USC Oregon. And we killed it. USC, we became the official necklace of the USC football. Games. So if you ever go to USC, and I'm sure people have been to those games, everybody is wearing the USC Kukui nuts. I and once we got, yeah. I, we went to the homecoming game where they uh, they they put Troy Polamalu into the Hall of Fame, maybe like four or five years ago, and that's yeah. why I saw it. Yeah, it was good. And we, you know, because of this, it's opened so many doors. Just like we were at Troy's birthday party in Pittsburgh. We were at this event, you know, um, for USC, you know, we right. Keck Medical Group. We do so much with USC. That was the one school that I'm so grateful for and will never forget, you know, and we still have their account. We're still big sponsors of USC football. So whenever there's a football game, you will see our people walking around. We're the only company allowed to walk around the stadium and sell products. And it's, awesome. uh, it was awesome. So. From USC, long story short, we were able to get other schools, um, Pac-12. It took us a while to get the SEC, the Big Ten, and it, it just snowballed. And then I thought, well, if it works for the college, let's try the NFL. What about the league? Yeah. Oh, so this was the hard part. If you go to NFL.com or Google NFL how to get a license, it'll blow your mind because you're like, there's no way I'm going to ever do this. It's That's going right. to take a year That's just right. to fill out the paperwork. So I tried a different angle. We knew this guy in New York and I said, look, again, I'm a Samoan. There are no Pacific Island businesses that represent the NFL. And look how many per capita play, right? It's yeah, not yeah. fair. Can you get me an appointment with the NFL? You know, the, the people that make the decision. He says, it's a long shot, but I'll make a call. He made a call, and the following week, we had to fly out to New York. Okay, so get this. We're going to New York to the NFL offices, and I'm like, I'm so nervous. I, I'm like freaked out because my head is telling me I'm not good enough. My mm. vocabulary isn't good enough. This product is stupid. They're not going to like it. You know, who am I? What? And I almost turned around and just said, forget it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I could remember my mentor saying to me, just breathe, be in the moment, get out of your, get out of that bad neighborhood. And he's always, he calls my head a bad neighborhood. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So he said, get out of the bad neighborhood and be in the moment and just do your best. That's it. Just do your best. And so uh, me and my partner, Scott, at the moment, at that time, we went in and I did the full presentation. 
And after the presentation, the lady that was sitting, one of the, there was five of them in there. She goes, that was one of the best presentations that I've ever seen because I incorporated our culture and what it meant to us. And then the other thing is she went to school with Joe Salavia. <laughs> oh, big Joe. Big Joe, who is my cousin. From Arizona. When she saw the last name. Yeah. When she saw the last name, she was like, do you know Joe? I said, yeah, Joe's my cousin. She was like, oh, that's cool. I had no idea. So we left the office two hours later. I get a call. We got the license. Awesome. <laughs> what an awesome story. Man, that was crazy. And, you know, it's one of those, I mean, so that didn't, it didn't finish. The guy that made the call to the NFL, he said, hey, Willie, you know, I made the other calls. Go, go show your product. So we went to the MLB office. We went to the NBA office. We went to NHL. We even went to Nickelodeon because we thought, oh, how, how cool to have square pants and SpongeBob necklaces, you know? Right. We got kicked out of there quick because they're like, kids will choke on it. You know, we're not going to give you any license for right. that. Right, right, right. But the other leagues loved it. And within 48 hours, we had every sport there was, including Major League Soccer, MLS. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big wow. It was one of those things where like, how does that happen? But along with that came advanced royalties. We had no idea what that was. And what that means is you pay the leagues for the license, a huge amount of money for the license. And it could be as low as 100,000 up to 20 million. Right. 100,000 right. was always the smallest amount. Right. You know, and that's the NFL. Then you had the other ones. So I got all these licenses, and um, I thought, I've got to get them. All. I've got, we got to do this. We got to find a way to do this. Because now I'm in fear after what that woman did to us with the license in the college. Mm. I'm thinking now our products out there, they're going to see it. Somebody else is going to try to take it and license it. And we're not going to have the opportunities. Right. So we licensed everything and we pulled everything out of our 401k, me and Scott. We borrowed money from family, friends, whatever we could do to get that license. And we made it happen. We got all the license. And then the funny thing with businesses, and I've learned all this over the years, is great. Now we have a license. Now we have to make the product. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and now where's the money to make the product? Where's the money oh, yeah. for the fact? Where's the warehouse? You know, packaging, all that stuff that you, you know, I was quick to say yes. But when I look back at that, I'm thinking, okay, I learned a great lesson, but it was very costly. It cost us a lot yeah, of money. Yeah. So you I, were literally building the plane while you were flying. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was. And that's why I share with a lot of business owners now. I said, ask me questions, you know, because I will be happy to share with you my, uh, my learning experience. I don't call them failures because everything I've gone through to this point has brought me to this point. You know, it's the best lessons I've had because I could share those mistakes I made. And it, it was because of ego. You know, I held on to a lot of the licenses when I should have let go after the first year because, oh, what will people think if I, you know, I lost that license after one year? Right. You know, they're right. going to talk about me. They're going to say this and they're going to say, oh, he's a bad business person. So I held on and held on and held on. And it just hurt me. It's because of my ego, you know? Sure. And, yeah. uh, and I look back in that, at that stuff, and then a lot of that has to do with the steam stuff. When we go back to my high school years, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of that is my past. You know, I'm bringing the past there. But long story short, I mean, I got the NFL license, the NCAA. I still carry them, the uh, the NCAA. The NFL license I only do on special occasions with special events, is because. That has opened up so many opportunities for me, having had, having had those licenses, that now I'm in every single grocery store in California for now that we do, um, we did all the colleges and NFL. Now we do them specifically for events. So Olympics, we'll do them. Uh, graduation, class of 2021. So if you walk into a store in California, like to a... Uh, uh, a Kroger store, a Stater Brothers, Ralph's, 
bonds. You'll yeah, find our shout product. out Stater Brothers. That's SoCal all the way. <laughs> Stater Brothers, baby. Stater yeah. Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. You will see our, our product in there. And two years ago, we went national with uh, Target. Right. And that was a great event. So this year, Target, and this is it. The ball is in our court this year because everybody wants the product now that things are opening up. Yep. And it's been very difficult to supply because we can't even get cardboard for the shippers. Shippers are the displays that go into the stores where you just pop them up and then you yep. put the product in. Yes, sir. For those of those that don't know. But um, we can't even get cardboard because Amazon has purchased all the cardboard for shipping yeah, yeah. product during the COVID. There's a shortage everywhere on cardboard. Yeah. Yeah. So we're at the point we had to turn them down. We turned down Target this year. Wow. And it was hard for me because I'm looking at the dollar signs. You're like, oh, shoot. But I've remembered in the past everything for a reason. There's no, you know, everything for a reason. And I was, we're not ready for this year to carry Target, you know, but we've got other stores. So I'm grateful for all that. And um, I've just had, it's been a wonderful journey. Um, I've been, uh, also, we, we talked a lot about my drinking, you know. I've been sober now since September 25th, 2003. I haven't touched a single drop. About 18 years? 18 years. It'll be 19 Man, years. so Thank that's you. amazing. Sober for that long. Yeah. So just, like, just like when I had to do anger management counseling in college as a college senior, uh, my counselor made me understand that every time I was drunk was when I got into issues and while I was in her office anyway. That's the awareness that you got uh, <laughs> yes, before 2003, it. right? And we knew, we know this as people that either are alcoholic or I'm, I was borderline, I guess, alcoholic. I mean, I drank all the time like you, like listening to your story, that was me. Uh, uh, everything associated with a good time and now no longer working was with alcohol, but then it also got dark really fast because yeah. as soon as it got after 1230 and anything just didn't go right, mm -hmm. it was a snap. Come on, Willie, real talk, right? So first right. off, congratulations on 18 years and, and finish off your, your genesis point to that, to now making a point about alcohol, alcoholism and just the bad Willie that shows yeah. up. So the bad Willie, um, I was one of those guys that would be on the corner. You know, you see them now, 7-Eleven. Hey, bro, you got a dollar? Can I get a dollar? Because my only goal in life was to get that next 40 ounce. And I mm. saw 40 ounce because that was the fastest way to get a buzz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I graduated from the 40 ounce to the wine, to the wine right. box, from the wine box to hiding the vodka, from the vodka to the scotch. Yes, and it was sir. never enough. You know, I would always think, oh, I'm so bored. Let me drink. Well, it was fun for the first hour for me. Then after that, the rest of the evening was like, you know, it was it was a dark place. You call it a dark place. And nobody wanted to be around me. And you talk about self-pity. If you're already in self-pity and you start drinking more and then you throw on those slow jams, oh, it's over. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> it's over. Woe we is start me. giving a concert with our own mental issues right. within us, right? Yeah. <laughs> Woe is me. Look at me. Nobody loves me. I was one of those relationships that you could tell me you love me a hundred times a day. And I would say, well, how much do you love me? Right, right. Right? Because right. I didn't love myself. Yes, I sir. could not love myself. And it just takes, um, I had to hit that rock bottom. I remember hitting that rock bottom. And my rock bottom was September 24th, not the 25th. 25th is when I got 24th is when I'd laid there in my apartment feeling so sorry for myself where I wanted to kill myself. Mm. And so I took my pills. I took that alcohol. And I thought, well, nobody loves me. Maybe if I go to the hospital from overdosing, they'll all come running to me and they'll show me their love. That's mm. That was my crazy thinking. That's how I thought. It was all how, how life was. So I did that, went to the hospital that night. Nobody came. <laughs> wow. Nobody came to the hospital. That's because of the way I treated people. The right, right word. I didn't keep my word. I, there was no such thing as, a, you know, a dependable willy. Um, you know, my actions proved otherwise. 
you know, it was my words, I would say one thing and do another thing, you know. And so, of course, why would anybody, why would I have people that love me and friends? Because I treated them so rotten. And so I got some great mentors. I got into a great program and uh, started to change my life. And even to this day, it's a continuous journey. You know, mm. it doesn't, It just because, you know, I stopped drinking doesn't mean I'm still not an asshole. I'm still an asshole. I'm just not drinking. Right, right. It just <laughs> comes know? out more yeah. when you're drinking. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, right. After, after the good times, you know, a couple of hours at, at, towards the end, every time after 2 a.m., I mean, man, what, my, what a story. Yeah. In my, that, really, we've come to the segment of the show where there's three things. So you've shared such an amazing story. I and the listening audience, we are going to be eagerly awaiting your book. <laughs> that that you could print out. I mean, you need to write a book, brother. I mean, you. you are a you are a genuine success story um, that, in spite of you know self sabotage, right? Yeah, self sabotage. That's it. I mean, that's what I teach, train, and coach as a success coach. Is man, we're, that's why I just focus on the client, not their industry, not success. We account for time and money because that has a huge factor into our opportunities to do, create, and be things. Right. But other than that, it's it's all a human approach that it's the person. So in that, what is your message to the world? Um, and who would you like to shout out? And, and, and in that realm, start with that. Like, what, what is Willie Salabea's message to the world with all of the experience you just, I mean, used to travel and fly just to party in the sky, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was your deal. And then, and then you started to figure out a few things. You've been in New Zealand. Uh, you, somebody tried to bully you corporate wise, right? Somebody tried to go gangster on your product, yeah. right? Of all these things, what are the one to three things that you'd like to share that's Willie Salabert's message to the world? Staying in the moment, letting go of fear. You know, fear kept me from doing so much, you know? And sometimes I kick myself. I'm like, I could have had this sooner. Like, I wish it was 10 years back and then I could have everything I have now back then, you know? And it's, it's not the way it works though, as much as I'd like it to, everything in my life that I've gone through, including the worst day, you know, trying to take my own life and trying, you know, hanging out at that corner, trying to, you know, um, not trying, but begging for money and getting, you know, trying to, oh, not trying, asking for, you know, passage on a bus because I couldn't afford a dollar 25. All that has led up to where I am today. Right, and I cannot forget that. I cannot forget where I've come from, right? But fear is the one thing when you talk about is the what ifs. How many of us question ourselves daily? You know, we wanna change jobs, we hate our job, but what if I can't pay my bill? What if I don't have my, you know, what if? You know, we could what if ourselves to death because of fear and not wanting to take that step. And my mentor has always used that acronym for fear, false evidence, evidence appearing real. real right? yes, sir. Or the other one is fuck everything and run. And rise. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> real and, talk. You know, and, and the thing is, once you get past that, but you got to recognize it first. You have to be aware of it. If there's no awareness, you can't make any change. That's right. You know, so... Um, I've been blessed spiritually that I'm aware of things now. Now I can make a choice to change it or I could sit in the funk, you know, and be fearful. And like I said, it's a journey. The other day, you know, I was with my husband, who's now my husband, Scott. And now I still have problems getting angry. You know, he'll say something, I get angry and I don't know how to apologize. Mm. You know, I feel like if I apologize, I'm weak. You know, that now if I say something nice, you're going to know that you're going to be able to do that to me again, mm. you know, but you see how I'm processing. At least I'm aware of it now. I never knew that stuff before. 
So now I can make a choice to be angry all day. And I've improved because I could be angry for a whole week and not talk to somebody. Come on, that's good talk. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. can carry it. Yes, sir. We could carry. I'm good. I don't care if you hate me. You know, I, I'm talking even my mom. <laughs> right, know? right. All right. But now I'm down to about maybe a couple hours, three hours, you know. So I'm improving. And uh, I'm not a saint, man. None of us are. We all have our you know, our, our good days and our bad days. But if we could get past that fear, recognize it, and um, know that you're worthy of the best life ever. My son says to me every day, Dad, I had the best day and then I always finish ever. He's been saying that since he's been able to talk. Right. You know, it's one of those things. And it's a reminder, I had the best day ever because that's all we have. There's no guarantee of tomorrow. And I know that even more now coming out of COVID. Right. right we are blessed we're the blessed ones so many of our people died from this you know mm -hmm. and I, I can't and i'm so grateful that i'm alive and now what am i going to do with this time am i going to sit here and go oh what if <laughs> I, you got to take the action and i teach that to my kids and when i mean my kids my my son and my nephews and nieces and if they're watching this uncle's telling you again stop talking and take the action Ooh, it's about yeah, action yeah. not words action so get out there get your degrees get your job get your trade do something with your life and again my great mentor said to me the only wrong way to do something is not do it at not all doing it yeah that's right real talk. right bro mm -hmm. and so that that's basically your fear remove it get out of your head be in the moment, do what's in front of you and uh, stay in today. There's nothing we can do about tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and I, as, although I'm saying that stuff, just last week, the president of Olympia called me, right? And he left a message on my phone. Willie, I need to talk to you. I'm gonna put another person on the phone with us and, and um, um, we need to talk about the apparel line. And then his voice, and of course, where's the first thing I go in my head? Oh, oh my gosh. Wrong? What's, what's wrong? wrong? Yeah, what yeah, did yeah. I do wrong? They're going to take the account. The contract is, you know, forget the five-year contract. This and the worst case scenario went into my head. I got on the phone. He goes, we really love the line. And this is what we're doing. We just wanted you, know, you to fly out to Orlando so that we could go ahead and see how much space you need for all your apparel. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> it's my head. I got to train that. Yep. So let's go over that message to the world one more time. You said fear, okay. right? Uh, you said it in other ways, uh, but I say call it uh, face everything and rise, right? Rise. Yeah. Uh, you know, rise, right? And it's false evidence appearing real. That was your first one, right, Willie? Is fear. Yeah. Stay in the present moment, right? Big time. Right. And then you said, and was the third one action? Yeah. Not words. You're talking to your nieces and nephews like do it right. So that's your message to the world. The acronym for fear, like face everything and rise and don't let fear control you control your fear because we all anyone that has any certain level of success, we still fear the fear but in spite of the fear Willie, mm -hmm. come on tell them what do we do. Right, we, we move forward we go we walk through it. Right. Stay in the present. And so recap really quickly for us. What does be in the present mean? For me, it means being in the moment. So I can actually forecast the outcome. You know, I've got this crystal ball right here. And in the present, yes, sir. And, I, you know, but for me, my crystal ball always looks at the future and says, your life is going to be screwed up. <laughs> right, 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 right. But what I've had to do is because I'm forecasting what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. But if I stay here in the moment and I'm talking to you right now, I'm having this wonderful conversation. You know, I could be present, enjoy this, and share my experience, strength, and hope with you. Mm. Exact everything, and not think about oh my gosh, I got to pay for this bill tomorrow. Oh my gosh, uh, you know and. It was, and it's that simple for some families out there. I know, I know from my own experience with my personal family, 
sometimes like fall of love is, you know? Oh, yeah. I'm not We're, Samoan and I already know what that means. Right. Because <laughs> tongue it's is Samoan. Specific. Right. Somebody dies. Yeah. And during COVID, this was hard for a lot of families because so many people were having it, were dying. And it's a communal thing for those of you that don't know. We help that family. It's a, it, you know, it's a- Two, three times a week. Right. This of this thing, right? Right. So if a, if a high chief or a Matai say, hey, this family, you give 500. I just gave 500. <laughs> well, this is another cousin. So it was a couple thousand extra a month. Yeah. Know? Yes. And you're just, and um, it's like, how do I get that? So, you know, if you're giving that money, I'll use my example. I'm like, I get angry because I get into this fear, right? And anger is just, um, is fear, right? And I, I, for me, for me. And um, so during that time, I would get really angry. And I was like, why do I have to give this money? Why do we do this? Why do we have to give that? And it was because, I, I kept going to the what ifs, you know, yeah. the what ifs of what if I can't, you know, pay for this and what if I can't pay for that? And um, my mother would just, you know, I, I could see her crying and say, oh, we got to give this, we got to give yeah, that. Yeah, right. But the thing is, I came back to the moment and I would think, well, is that really, do I have $2,000 a month? Yes. Right. <laughs> right. So right. what what am I complaining? You know, why am I feeling this? It's because of my fear of losing it. I still have this fear. It's so right. weird, Coach V. I still have, I have a lot. I have a beautiful home now. We've been remodeling for two years. I now have the cars. I, you know, all that stuff. It's stuff. Right. But my head, my head still is in fear of losing it and being poor again. Yes, sir. It's the strangest thing. And so someday I have to catch myself. I have to, I try to work harder, 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 more hours, more hours, bring on more accounts, say yes to everything that comes in front of me to where I'm just like, what, why are you doing this? So I got to check myself, evaluate myself and go, you're doing this out of fear. Right. You're, you, you don't want to be poor. Right. But the fact is, it's not real. <laughs> That's right. And right. The third part was action. And we're just going to, we're going to stream this into the Coach V hot seat, which is the last segment. We only got about three or four minutes left, Willie. I usually say, so this question will also be part of the first question of the hot seat is, you say action. And I tell most of my clients and ask them to consider, there's the noun of success. There's the noun of love. But both success and love are nouns that work better as verbs because without action, you're right. Love That's it. That's it. Your thoughts on the Coach B hot seat, Willie? Oh, I love that. Noun versus verb. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, don't ask what an adjective. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, it, it's true that um, action, we have to take action. I could sit, you know, um, one of my things, my mom always says, oh, just have faith and pray. <laughs> That's true, partially. Yes, sir. That's part of it. That's part of That's the equation. Part of yes, it. That's part of it. And I've learned that as well, that you've got to surrender, turn it over. Mm. But you can't just turn it over and just not do anything, yes, sir. you know? I believe there's a power out there, whether you call it God, Buddha, whatever you choose to call this power. But for me is like, I have to, when I turn it over, then I have to ask for the knowledge of what is my next step, mm. right? And I've learned over the time that sometimes I just got to sit quietly and just do what's in front of me. Because sometimes I, my prayer could be this, like this, God, what's taking you so long? Right, right. Right. And then God would be like, oh, so now you need to practice patience, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Let me hold on to the answer for a little bit longer. And there's many times in my life where I thought I knew this is the, my plan. This is my life. It should be this way. And when I was so focused on this, everything else was happening over here. I was missing out on, it, you know? So it's like sometimes my best plan isn't 
what's meant for me, I got to stay open. Mm. You know, you got to stay open and the, it happens. It really does. Like my nickname sometimes would be, here comes analyze this. <laughs> and that's my nickname, analyze this. Because I was asked, I was asked why, 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 you know, instead of doing. That's right. That's right. I want to add to that, this part of the hot seat question. And because what you're talking about is accountability as well. And to me, I think so many people are unaware that they're not only accountable, that there will be consequences for your choices in what you do. But we're also accountable for what we do not do. Take 30 seconds and touch on that for me, Willie, please. Ooh, that's strong, Coach B. We don't talk, right? to. That's the highest level. It's like, yeah, you're accountable for, for what you do. Yes. I think a lot of people understand that. But there's a higher level of consciousness and awareness is that without planting the seed, we are now going to be accountable for what we do not get, which also causes some of your anxiety and fear, correct? Right. 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 So there is a duality in that. But people don't understand that it is in the learning, it's in the process, it's in the doing that we learn that we should not do this and we should be doing it like that. Your thoughts, Willie. Take 30 seconds because we're running out of time, but I want to get to one more question. That That's really powerful stuff. I never thought of it that way, you know, uh, being accountable for not sharing, you know. That's right. And I could only relate that story to... Uh, me being an alcoholic, you know, unless I had gone through that, I can't, sh- you know, I, I can't keep it. I have to give it away. That's right. Right. I, and in, in order for me to stay sober and to have what I have today, I have to give away. I have to be of service. I have to do things uh, for others, you know. Um, and that I've always noticed that when I'm always, you know, depressed or sad or, you know, not getting my way. It's all about me. Right. Right. It's all about me, 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 me. And the best way to get out of me is by doing service to others. Real and so for me, like if that happens or I, I have to share my story with somebody else, another alcoholic who might be going through the rough patches, you know, and I could relate. I share my story. I don't tell them what to do, but I tell them my experience and what I did to get out of it. Right. Right. And so I, I think that's important because I've been, you know, being Pacific Islanders, we're told, you know, from the church, do this, yeah, do that, do this, do that. And for me, and I'm sure for a lot of entrepreneurs like yourself, as soon as you're told what to do, <laughs> if you have a personality like me, I'm like, oh, really? I'm yeah, not that's right. Yeah. That. Real talk. <laughs> That's really <laughs> yeah. and, and here's the last question on the Coach B hot seat, which to me, I really present for the highest level leaders in co- county, city, and national agencies, CEOs, and the big dogs is this. Here's the irony of success. And then please take 30 seconds to a minute to reply on what is on top in the forefront of your mind after I say this. The irony of success is that to be successful, we must be totally focused, absolutely immersed, and absolutely committed. The irony of that absolute focus, commitment, and to be fully immersed is we leave ourselves susceptible to being unaware and blindsided by neglect. Your thoughts? Ooh, that's that's tough. I, I'm, I'm not clear really on what that means right now. So. Maybe in layman's terms, you could help me out with that one. I'm going to say, and you'll catch it. The irony of success is that you must. So success demands focus, absolute full immersion, and fully committed. Mm -hmm. But in that full commitment, total focus, absolute immersion, we leave ourselves susceptible to being blindsided by neglecting other facets of our lives say our physical mental health right. our person, family yeah. our family time our spirituality our finances we start focusing on just the outcome and which is good because success that's the only way to be successful but the irony is we pay a cost so so what is your thought on that it's like yes be you because you said it 
unaware is unaware. So if you don't think like that, then that's when really you leave yourself susceptible to neglect, right? And not being aware because people don't think about, oh man, I'm burning my relationships by doing this. I'm burning my spirituality. Yes, we live in this lifetime between anywhere, if you're lucky, 67 to 105 years old, but eternity on the other side is a long ass time. And when you're focused and you're trying to succeed in this life, we start to neglect and we know it, but we're so unaware because we're so focused, Willie. For a person with the immense success that you have happened to, either some people are like, man, he just fell upon these relationships. And no, this stuff don't happen by chance. They happen by choice because people make these choices. But then now you hit this level of success and you're like, man, B, I've never been this unaware. I'm more aware now. Your thoughts on that? Take a minute, please, Willie. So one of the most important things for me right now that I I realized is Willie has got to take care of Willie first, right? Um, Without Willie, there's nothing else, right? I cannot give away something I haven't got. That's right. Period. You know, if my life spiritually isn't in in, in place, uh, if I'm not doing service, if I'm not being with my family, I don't have anything else. That's right. I don't. And um, again, it might sound selfish because as Pacific Islanders, we're not raised to look at yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're looked at, take care of that family, take care of this, take care of everybody, take care, take care, take And that was my downside. I've lost, I gave away so much that I had nothing left for me. So now today, this morning I got up, I go to the gym, you know, that's time for myself. I roll into the office and, you know, I say my little prayer, my little gratitude prayer. And I read this every morning when I get in. Let me get this for you. Yes, sir. This is what I live by today. It's my little sign. Yeah. You see it? Yes, sir. That's right. And the, the greatest work we will ever do will be within the walls of our own home. Own home. And that's for my son. Yeah. You know. And I, I preach this to all my, and not only my son, my nieces, and nephews, and um, our next generation is really important. Yes. You know, sir. They have. We have to have the gen- Our next generation has got to be better than us. We didn't grow up with um, the wealth, you know, generational wealth. But we have a very, I know for me, I have a um, responsibility to my kids that they have that and then that they do something with it, you know. And I'm so grateful that I am where I am today, you know, with this. And I've learned so much. And I can't thank you enough for allowing me to show, share a part of my story. And also, I learned a lot today. Just in that short time you were speaking, you know, I, I, I like a lot of what you said. So I, I hope to use that in my life. Man, and it's good. I'm learning. I'm learning. You know, I'm learning you gotta so practice much. this, right? We gotta we gotta practice this stuff. Yes, sir. Every day. Every day. Every day. Man, thank you, Willie, for coming on the Coach V show. Thank you for sharing. Um, this is just episode one of a lot of episodes between hopefully Coach V and Willie as he has time and can make time to just uh take us on his journey. And then really we have every opportunity to deploy the life lessons, the success frameworks, and the behavioral models. Because the good thing about these things is if you can fail because of your lack of life lessons, lack of success frameworks, or lack of behavioral models, that means you could also succeed if you would do these things. And what Willie was alluding to, I think we all feel that when we don't prioritize the things that really matter to not only our success, but also our life, fulfill, life fulfillment from my space and in my industry in which I've been an expert for 10 years, you feel an incongruence, you feel a misalignment. And then the times that everything is aligned and working greatly, right, Willie, isn't all the time, but what we're searching for and trying to create in terms of these standard operating procedures of our life is that we can keep it at the highest level for as long as we can. Because all of us are in this position, as Willie already alluded to, um, 
but it's not a permanent position. My life, my positions, the standing that I hold in the community and Willie, these are transitional positions because they do not last forever. Yeah. <laughs> they do not last forever. So Willie, thank you for coming on the show. And for all thank of you, you thank you so much for tuning in to your boy, Willie Salavea and the co-host here on the Coach V Show for today's Willie Salavea Show, Coach V. And, and really, here's the reason why. Because of it is of great importance for each of us to achieve success. But not for the sake of just being successful, but for the sake of being our best. In doing so, we realize the best of our abilities and that everything and anything that we dream and work for can be achieved. This is how this success coach, keynote speaker, Hollywood radio show host and author lives all about faith and family, grateful for God's amazing grace. You can catch me here every Modern Motivation Monday here on Island City where the beach meets the streets, your personal and professional radio development show. Uh, the Coach V Show, where iron sharpens iron. Together, we rise. Until next time, next time, one love, mad respect from Las Vegas, Willie Salavea, and here from Elk Grove, Hollywood, coming through Hollywood, your boy, Coach V. One love and mad respects always. Until next time, peace. peace.